You're listening to Advancing Our Church. Welcome to Advancing Our Church, a Changing Our World podcast about Catholic stewardship, leadership, and advancement. And I'm your host, Jim Friend. Well, welcome back, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We have another terrific episode today, and our special guest is Bishop Alfred Schlert, Bishop of the Diocese of Allentown. But first, this week we celebrated Memorial Day, which is an opportunity as a nation to remember and appreciate those who have died so that we might live freely. The blessings of stability and prosperity and freedom we enjoy are a testament to the price our veterans have paid. As Catholics, we remember, of course, those who have gone before us and we pray for their souls. And this past weekend, many parishes offered Mass for the repose of those who have died in service to our great nation. You know, oftentimes as people, we tend to take our blessings for granted. Perhaps this week, we can live beyond just that day and be inspired to live the kind of grace that God is calling us to live, the grace of sacrificial love, the kind of love that Jesus expressed for us when he made the ultimate sacrifice, the divine sacrifice for all of us. As we remember his sacrifice, the sacrifices of the saints, and the sacrifice that so many Americans have made throughout history for our freedom, we remember what life is really all about, love. And what is God? God is love. And so, what should your life be about? Now, Let's get to work. My guest today is Bishop Alfred Schlert, who was appointed the fifth bishop of the Diocese of Allentown by Pope Francis on June 27, 2017. Bishop Schlert is a native son of the five county diocese that serves Berks, Lehigh, Northampton, Carbon, and Schuylkill counties in eastern Pennsylvania. He was ordained a priest in September 1987 under Bishop Thomas Welsh and served directly for all three of his predecessors, first as Vice-Chancellor and Secretary to Bishop Welsh, and later as Vicar General to both Bishop Edward Cullen and Bishop John Barris. And we talk about what it was like taking over for them during our interview. Both Bishop Schlert and the Diocese of Allentown celebrate their 60th birthdays this year, and so, as Catholics around the country return to in-person Masses, the bishop has appropriately named the theme of this diocesan anniversary year, the Year of Real Presence Centered in the Holy Eucharist. I think you're really going to enjoy getting to know the bishop on our show today. And so, without further ado, here is Bishop Alfred Schlert. There we go. I mean, I have to just click here so I can see it better. Continue. Okay. Well, Bishop Schlert, welcome back to Advancing Our Church. It's great to have you back on the podcast. Thanks, Jim. Great to be back. Always a pleasure. It's great to see you. You know, for those who um, may or not may or may not know our relationship, you know, I worked uh, for the Diocese of Allentown. Uh, I guess about six years ago I left, but uh, for about, about eight and a half years, and you and I got to work together pretty closely as the Vicar General and the Director of Stewardship and Development, and, and now I'm um, in formation in the Diocese of Allentown, as most of uh, our, my friends know, and, and uh, in the Diaconate Program, and, and now you're the Bishop uh, of Allentown. It's exciting to see uh, how things have grown and evolved, but uh, it's, it's, I appreciate our friendship, and I appreciate you coming on the, on the show today. Yeah, happy to. Very happy to. And congratulations uh, on the 60th anniversary of the Diocese of Allentown. I feel like it was just yesterday when you and I sat at a table and we're planning the 50th anniversary of the Diocese of Allentown. <laughs> <laughs> time, time really, really flies. Uh, it's a huge accomplishment, obviously, and um, and the the clergy and the parishioners must feel proud. I, there must still be a few clergy around who were around when the diocese was announced, when the split off came from Philadelphia years ago. You still have a few guys who remember those days? We still do. Um, most of them, of course, at this point would be retired. Sure. Um, but they do. And they, they have um, they have very fond memories, actually, uh, of um, that day. It was, you know, it was kind of just happened out of the blue. Mm -hmm. uh, they woke up one day and found out that uh, if you're in the five counties of, of what are now the Diocese of Allentown, no matter where you came from, uh, that's where you're going to be. And uh, mm -hmm. so 
it was it was exciting uh, from their rendition of it, but mm -hmm. there were also some guys that were a, a little uh, apprehensive because they were from the Philadelphia area, mm -hmm. and you know now they were really uh, you know in the northern counties, and they weren't uh, the, the general uh, practice at the time was eventually you worked your way back closer to Philadelphia. So for most of them, they would eventually have been working their way back to uh, closer to their, their families. Mm -hmm. But uh, all of them, you know, in hindsight now say that they were, they were, uh, they were very grateful. They see it kind of providentially because it was a, a brand new diocese, lots of possibilities. Um, they were able to be pastors much sooner Mm -hmm. uh, than they would have been in the archdiocese because uh, just we had a great need at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, yeah, the, I, I call those, those early priests the pioneers. <laughs> they were, uh, right. Because they, they did blaze the trail and along with Bishop McShay. And uh, when you stop to think they, uh, you know, that you're, they form a diocese, but uh, they don't really give, uh, they meaning Rome, doesn't yeah. really give a lot of direction about, how to construct it. Right. And so you have to start all of your, uh, you know, social services and things like that, because now they're, they're all part of a separate diocese now. So mm -hmm. uh, they were, they were exciting times, but certainly we can't romanticize them too much. They were also challenging times, but the, the priests and the people and the religious at the time, they, they really did have that uh, spirit of uh, we're starting something uh, great here and we want we want to you know be a part of it and you grew up during that that time period right as a son of the diocese out in easton yeah you know it was interesting when i was or, ordained a priest um uh, the the ad times uh, came up with a little um, factoid uh, they did a little research and they found that uh, i was the first priest who was born and raised living his whole time in the Diocese of Allentown. Wow. Even my classmates, they were born before the establishment of the diocese by even by a couple months. So, wow. um, yeah, so there's a little factoid. So yeah, that's the Diocese of Allentown has been my home for forever. That's incredible. So yeah. you must, you, you bring a unique perspective because, you know, we're, our family are kind of transplants to, to the diocese. We came about 13 years ago, but but you, you've watched this area grow up quite a bit over the last 50 or 60 years, right? Oh, it's amazing to see, uh, even starting with my, my own neighborhood there in Palmer Township, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just on the other side of our, our, the other set of houses across the street was a big open field Yeah, where we used to, ourselves, we used to cut it so we could play ball and things like that. And of course, now mm -hmm. that's all houses and now, you know, the diocese um, in many areas has just exploded yep. with expansion and housing and warehousing. And the thing that I, I really uh, say, this really isn't, um, it really isn't having anything to do with uh, the diocese per se, but it has to do with the people. Mm -hmm. When you look at the industries that the diocese, the people in the diocese depended on, when you look at coal and railroading and steel, uh, almost all of that is gone or greatly diminished. Right. And yet the ingenuity of our people that knew how to adjust and in many ways, our, our diocese has gone from being um, a provider of, of goods to a provider of services. Hmm. You look at, you look at uh, healthcare mm -hmm. in every corner of our diocese, how prevalent it is. Mm -hmm. uh, education, especially, you know, higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, those, are, those are big employers. And so our, our people knew, knew how to adjust. They, they, as it's, a, it, it, it's quite a thing. And um, the, the Lehigh Valley right now is the largest growing uh, area in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It's wonderful. So, um, uh, you know, that's, that's due to a lot of factors, but, but it gives us, I say that because it gives us even more opportunities to evangelize 
Mm -hmm. You know, and again, not just in the Lehigh Valley and not just in Berks County, mm -hmm. but also in Carbon and Schuylkill counties. Mm -hmm. You know, we, mm -hmm. we, we have a richness in our people mm -hmm. and a depth of faith everywhere uh, that is, is so, um, so much a blessing uh, to us. You know, even as, you know, from outside and, and even objectively, we can see the number of parishes going down, the number of priests going down, the number of schools going down. Mm -hmm. uh, we can tend to get into um, a cycle uh, that's um, kind of negative, but mm -hmm. we don't have to do that. You know, we can, we, right. we can and should be positive about where God is calling us what new avenues he's opening for us and where his grace is leading us. Mm -hmm. So it's 60 years of blessings uh, and certainly with the, uh, the, the, the prayer that we have many more of those blessings in the years ahead. I'm sure he will. And, you know, as someone who has raised his family in the diocese, I mean, my, my, my kids were very young when we moved here. Um, it has just been a tremendous place to raise a family, you know, just uh, just from a regional perspective. But but also, you know, the priests and the Catholic schools that we have here have really, I think, created a, a strong sense of community. They, they We didn't have any family uh, nearby. So when we came, our family's like a thousand miles away in a couple different states. And so that family in our parish really became our extended family. And, and uh, they say it takes a village and it certainly does. <laughs> it, certainly, it certainly helped us. I'm, I'm curious, Bishop, you know, as a, as a young man, what, um, when did you first hear your calling to become a priest? You know, I get that question a lot, Jim, and it's, uh, I'm always happy to answer it, but it's also very, very, uh, I would say uneventful. Um, mm. So, uh, what I would first say is that, um, like most people's vocations, yeah, um, we feel as if we have a natural inclination towards things, yeah, and you know, a natural inclination that already kind of takes off the table certain things, like mm -hmm. you know, um, you're not really going to be a doctor if you don't like the sight of blood, things like right. that, you know, just natural <laughs> things. Right. And so mine was very natural, I would say. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't say that I was always thinking about the priesthood. Mm -hmm. uh, like many boys my age, we started to serve mass. And you did have a bit of uh, awe in mm -hmm. being so close to the priest, serving at the altar and things like that. And so there was a, a spark there of, of interest. And, um, but it kind of went by the wayside, mm -hmm. or at least into the back of my mind. Um, then I got into high school and, you know, I did all the regular things of high school that any other student would do, mm -hmm. uh, all the same extracurriculars and, and um, sure. you know, social experiences. But then around junior year, it started to refocus. And, um, and then the thing that is always the scary thing happened. Someone said to me, in fact, it was a priest who said, you know, you should really consider the seminary. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever you talk to somebody who has a, you know, and they tell their vocation story, that's always kind of the moment of truth. Mm -hmm. Because up until then, it's something that you think is hidden. That no one else notices, but it's on your mind. Right. And then you start to say, gee. How about that? Somebody else sees that in me. It doesn't have to be a priest. It could be a lay person too. Sure. sure. Um, and then when you start to discern it a little better through prayer, um, and you, then you start to tell people and they say, gee, we're not surprised. Hmm. Um, so God works that way too in affirming what he's calling us to do. Mm -hmm. But it has to be done with, with prayer because remember in our lives, all of us, as uh, St. John Henry Newman said, all of us are created for some unique purpose that only we can fulfill. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really true. We may have the same vocation. We may have the same job. But only we 
can do it in the way God created us to do it. I always use the example of a nurse, right? A nurse, you have two nurses. They went to the same, they went through the same nursing school. They have the same certification, but they're going to do nursing according to their own personality. Mm -hmm. They're going to approach a patient in a different way. They're going to administer medicine in a different way. They're going to have a different bedside manner. Uh, And that's how it is with uh, all vocations is we might share that, but we are uniquely fulfilling God's plan for us. And when we do that, when we follow God's plan as he intended it for us, um, we're not going to be disappointed. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have to make sacrifices Mm -hmm. because every vocation entails sacrifice. Every single one of them. Uh, Every state in life demands sacrifice, but we won't have the sadness of feeling like we have misidentified what God has called us to. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, my, my story is very vanilla. It's very bland, Um, but that's generally how it happens. Uh, Mm -hmm. More often than not is through the course of normal human daily activity. Mm-hmm. becomes known to you but you have to pray though that's mm-hmm. what that's where the discernment comes in sure because you know discernment isn't just figuring it out it's prayerfully figuring it out to know god's will you know it's funny uh when you were talking about each one of us we we because as you know obviously i'm discerning my own vocation and we were coming home from our retreat at malvern uh, I was driving home with a, with one of the, my classmates, and we were just kind of talking about how the um, each of us will have, even though we will all have a parish assignment or we'll have you know whatever if we're all called to fulfill this vocation and become deacons, we'll all have that assignment that the diocese will assign us. But then, what else are we going to do with that vocation? What what is God calling us to be? So we just had an interesting conversation. What whether it's uh, doing a retreat or writing a blog or Whatever it is, I think for each, as I look at the guys that I'm getting to know, I think it's really fascinating because I think each of us are going to fulfill that vocation in our own unique way, in our own unique time, and with our own unique gifts from our own perspective and our own story. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the the beautiful parts about going through this formation process, really coming to understand what version of of myself that God is calling me to be and, and how that will hopefully minister to the needs that he puts in front of me, of the, the people that he puts, you know, in, in my life. So not unlike being a father. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I always say to our seminarians that um, the ideal seminarian is someone who also would have made a tremendous father mm-hmm. because so many of the attributes have to be, uh, in both in both vocations, you know, mm-hmm. you, you have to you have to want to provide for your family, whether it's your physical family in the case of a priest is spiritual family. Mm-hmm. You have to want to desire to be present to them. You have to desire to want to sacrifice for them. And um, it also means you also have to put aside um, some of your own self-interests uh, to to serve the needs of the family. Yeah. You know, Jim, I'm sure there's many times where you would have rather had to do one thing and instead we're called to do something else for the sake of the family. Oh, without a doubt. And, you know, um, I've always, I've often reflected on the thought that, you know, good fathers are not, we're not just made. We're not born. We're we're not born. We're made, right. We're kind of molded and crafted in time. I mean, I certainly was, uh, I'm, I'm, if I'm a good, if I'm a good father, it's because I have a great wife and because I have a faith in God and we have a good relationship. And we have that ability to talk to each other. And that has come over 20, almost 27 years of marriage of, of trial and error. Uh, certainly a lot of error on my part, the ability to say you're sorry, the ability to acknowledge when you're wrong and, and move forward. But um, it, it, it's a, that's as much a formation process as anything else without a doubt. It is. <laughs> yeah, it is. So as you uh, kind of shifting gears a little bit, Bishop, uh, moving into the present day, you you had this uh, this unique perspective just from my own 
just from from watching your your career a little bit and and working or seeing other bishops, as you said, you've grown up in this diocese, you've spent your life here, and and you had the unique perspective, I think, of working with or working under um, all of your all three predecessors, at least three of your of the four predecessors in the diocese of Allentown. Um, what was it like for you to? after having kind of been shepherded or mentored by maybe a couple of them and working for all of them in some way, what was it like to, to become the bishop and the leader of the diocese? Uh, it's been almost four years now. Well, uh, uh, first of all, um, you know, it, it was a privilege to work with each one of those uh, three bishops. The fourth bishop, of course, which was the first bishop, sure. Bishop McShea, he accepted me into the seminary. Yes. So uh, but I never had the privilege yeah. of, of working mm -hmm. with him, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the other three, Bishop uh, Welsh, Bishop Cullen, and Bishop Barris, uh, I did. I worked closely with all three of them. Yeah. And um, it really gives you an appreciation uh, for the men mm -hmm. and their gifts and talents and uh, the unseen sacrifices. Sure that were made for for priests and people mm -hmm. um, that no one will ever know and you know as, as it should be um, but it's um, it's still quite another thing to actually be the bishop yourself sure because you know you can recommend and you can offer an opinion and you can be the one who has to implement certain things uh, as, as the vicar general, like I was, but to be responsible for making the decision, uh, that's a whole other thing. Right. And I wouldn't say, I would say because of my, my experience with the, with working with those three bishops, I, I don't fear that. I don't fear having to make, decisions mm -hmm. but you do have a sense of the weightiness of many of them the gravity of many of them because uh yes they can affect people's lives and that's important but most importantly what you decide can affect and what you say and what you preach and what you teach mm -hmm. can affect people's souls mm -hmm. and before God, you're, you, meaning me, the bishop, is responsible for that. Mm -hmm. That's a big cross. Oh, yeah. And that's partly why, you know, a bishop wears a cross. Um, you know, and um, once, uh, once somebody said to me, uh, when I first became a bishop, I had it on. They said, is that cross heavy around your neck? I said, not physically. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, and, and that's why the bishop wears a cross to remind himself yeah. that uh, really, and it's not just for bishops, of course, we're all called to conform ourselves and to embrace the crosses in our lives, of but to remind the bishop that in a special way, yeah. he is called to embrace the cross for the sake of his people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and that's, uh, that's what God calls us to do yeah and um you know it's uh it's 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 a it's an awesome responsibility awesome in the sense of almost too big to comprehend but he well, gives I us remember, the grace to do it i remember bishop um i remember when I, I saw you at the press conference when you said uh you know as a diocese we've you know after bishop uh, barris had announced his departure to go to rockville center and we are in this time of um, of preparation and a prayer for our new bishop, and your comment at your opening, you know, press conference was, "I never suspected that we were praying for me." <laughs> 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 it must have been. I mean, that, that just that just that gave me the perspective of how awesome. I mean, how awesome of a responsibility you obviously understand that it is, and 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 as I knew you would, but. It was just, uh, it was humbling. It was a very humble comment that you made. <laughs> it really was. But, but to, to go back, Jim, uh, the beauty of working with the bishops that I worked with mm -hmm. was to see that each and every one of them in their own way, each one had a different skills, Sure. but each one of them were men of the church. Mm -hmm. 
their whole being was to do what was they felt in conscience was the right thing for the people of God. Mm -hmm. uh, people can debate uh, just like with any uh, human decision, you know, whether the timing was right or this or that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just part of the burden uh, of making decisions in anybody's life, not just the life of a bishop. Right. But they, they, they never did it um, for their own sake. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes put themselves under great strain uh, to make the decisions that they know they had, they knew they had to make. Well, and, and um, you know, having, having worked with you first under Bishop Cullen and then later Bishop Barris, I mean, under Bishop Cullen, having to merge and consolidate all those parishes back in 2008 must have really weighed on him, you know, just on a personal level, that's tremendous cross to bear and the pain that was felt by so many, um, and then, you know, certainly Bishop Barris made some very difficult decisions during his, his time as well. And as I know you have uh, in your time, it, it's, uh, it, it calls you to, I'm sure, a very, um, a very serious prayer life, <laughs> a, very, a very real encounter with Christ. <laughs> well, uh, it's true. You can't, uh, you can't really uh, sustain the work um, that needs to be done yeah. um, without without a lot of prayer, uh, you mm -hmm. can't, you can't make the correct decisions relying on your own gut instincts, your own right. knowledge. Um, you, you have to discern that. I use that word again, discern. You sure. have to discern that in prayer. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as a, as a bishop, uh, I, I often say um, none of us as bishops none of us as lay people, none of us as priests or religious get to choose the times in which we live and serve. Right. Uh, so, you know, you look at the, the, uh, the Bishop Athanasius very early in the history of the church. Mm. Uh, he fought so much against heresy. Mm. Um, and he was one of the few bishops in the church that hadn't fallen into the heresy called Arianism. Oh. Um, and so, uh, but he stuck with it and he saved, he saved the church in many ways, even when other bishops were way off base about this, mm -hmm. but I'm sure he didn't want that controversy in his life. Right. I'm sure he didn't want that pressure in his life. Yeah. Um, when you look at Pope Paul the sixth, for example, and all the turbulence that he had to deal with after the Second Vatican Council and the misinterpretation of so many things that came out of the Second Vatican Council um, that were either innocently or willfully misconstrued right. as to what the council was really saying. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he, he had to do that when he, when he uh, promulgated Humane Vitae, you know, the, the encyclical on human life, which talked about artificial birth control, mm -hmm. talked about a lot of things um, actually that he, he said would happen as a result of artificial contraception. And they're all here today. Mm -hmm. The tremendous disrespect for human life and things like that. But he was getting a lot of pressure, even from within the church to say, don't do this. Don't do this. Prominent theologians were against what he taught but he mm -hmm. stayed the course mm -hmm. and humanly he wasn't wouldn't have been able to do that mm -hmm. uh, it's it was the guidance of the holy spirit it was his own depth of prayer uh so uh like i said none of us get the chance uh to choose the times in which we live and serve mm -hmm. but all of us are where we are right when god needs us and wants us, mm -hmm. but we have to stay in touch with him through prayer so that we get it right. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this past year has certainly been, um, been that kind of year. We haven't, <laughs> <laughs> we haven't, uh, none of us chose this past year, but we certainly all had to, to deal with it in our own ways. And, you know, um, just my, my view from 3000 feet, there've been a, a lot of blessings and there's been some real challenges, but a lot of evolution too, I think, in ways that, uh, you know, for the church, 
that we've been able to move forward in, in a digital way that maybe would have taken us longer to do if we weren't kind of forced, you know, in, into doing this. And I know that, you know, as you look at, at, this, at this anniversary year, I'm sure that you have, there are many things to celebrate, you know, many, many accomplishments of the diocese, but also I'm sure many accomplishments of the, of the parishes. What, what are some of the things that, that come to your mind when you think of the ways in which the diocese has been blessed and, and to celebrate in the 60th anniversary? Well, uh, above all, I would say, um, and this has come out very clearly during uh, the pandemic, yeah. is that the greatest blessing of our diocese are the people, the laity, yep. the priests, the deacons, mm -hmm. the religious, the seminarians. So our greatest joy, our greatest resource and blessing is in the people. Mm -hmm. Now, but it's not about us because we are a people nourished on the Holy Eucharist. Mm -hmm. So that's why as part of our uh, 60th anniversary, mm -hmm. you know, we, we are also celebrating the year of the real presence. Right. Jesus Christ present in the Holy Eucharist his body, blood, soul, and divinity, because that's what nourishes us. Other than, other than that, we're a crowd. We're a crowd. Yeah. <laughs> what makes us a church is Jesus's presence in the Holy Eucharist and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we can uh, continue to um, survive when, you know, Things are very, very difficult. That's how we can adapt. And that's how we can continue to do our mission because of the goodwill of all of those people I mentioned in our diocese and the nourishment of the Holy Eucharist. Because without that, we are devoid of, of uh, our fuel, if you will, you know, and, and mm -hmm. we turn into a crowd instead of a church, yeah. a faith community. Absolutely. And, and as wonderful as online masses have been during this time of, of the pandemic, you know, it, it, we are getting to a point where people are starting to return to mass. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've had this conversation hearing you talk about the real presence and the year of the real presence. As a parent, it's, it's opened up an opportunity for me to talk about it with my kids, you know, because we've been doing one thing for the last year. Now it's time to go back, you know, to, to mass. And, and why is that? Why is that different? Why is that, you know, why can't we just watch it on TV, Dad? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you know, what, what, what is the difference? And so it, it's given us an opportunity to really talk about, you know, the real presence of the Eucharist and why that is important in our life and why that can't be substituted by watching it on, on TV. But mm -hmm. um, is that, was that part of your motivation for, for the, the theme for this year, kind of coming back to the table of the Lord and, and coming back to mass after this long period of quarantine? Well, it was part of it, Jim, uh, mm -hmm. a couple of things at work. Um, certainly that, that is a big part of it because already uh, like last Easter, uh, you know, under COVID, yeah. which was really only about two months into the shutdown. I remember. I, yeah. I already started to pray about how are we going to get people back? Mm -hmm. to church and that only intensified that concern only intensified with me as this went on and on and on mm -hmm. you know i think a lot of people uh, you know in march when we shut down think oh this is this is akin to a long weekend because of a blizzard or something right you know, we're all gonna have go back to work in just a few days well mm -hmm. um <laughs> that didn't happen no. and and so uh, you know it doesn't take a long time for a habit to form. Yeah. And so the habit of not going to church on Sunday and fulfilling my obligation by watching it online, uh, so to speak, fulfill the obligation, um, can become very comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's why early on I said to our staff, I said, we have to, we have to get people from the couch to the pew again. Yeah. Because the couch is more comfortable than the pew, right? You know, That's at least true. from. But well, what it lacks, of course, is the community aspect. 
And most importantly, it lacks the Eucharistic aspect Mm -hmm. because we can watch TV on mass, uh, mass on TV. We can make a spiritual communion. Does not have the same effect Mm -hmm. as receiving Jesus in the Holy Eucharist in the midst of the assembly, Mm -hmm. the people. So, so that was important. And, and that's part of the year of the real presence, Mm -hmm. the real presence of Christ, but also your real presence at mass before the real presence. Mm -hmm. So there's a little interplay of words there, but um, so that was the first thing that was my overriding. And then uh, somewhere in the midst of the pandemic, that uh, Pew study came out and said that only a third, uh, 31%, a little less than a third, yeah. of Catholics believe in the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. That's amazing, isn't it? It's, it, 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 it's frightening. It yeah. really is frightening. Mm-hmm. Um, and because that's our core belief. Mm-hmm. That's what makes the Catholic Church the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm is our belief in the real presence of Christ uh, in the Holy Eucharist. And so, you know, that's the air we breathe and we're, we're, we're uh, um, you know, asphyxiating ourselves if, if we're, not, uh, we're not believing that. Yeah. If we're just receiving Holy Communion as a matter of uh, form and proper etiquette and this is what we do when we go to mass, but it can't be devoid of belief. Mm-hmm. But I think that also uh, is, uh, you know, even in my pastoral letter, I said, you know, that we didn't just get here overnight. Um, you know, this has, this has reasons. Some of them are within the church, some are outside the church, but, you know, somewhere along the line, we, we kind of, uh, you know, I would say since the Second Vatican Council, we have we lost that idea of Eucharistic adoration and devotion, and you know we the preaching, uh, you know, and the homilies oftentimes moved away from that reality of Christ present in the Eucharist. Certainly, oftentimes, unfortunately, even in the religious formation of our youth it's not emphasized as much as it is. And then, and then you have the societal effects too, where um, more and more we start to see the fact that um, science, especially for younger people, science is really, and technology is really what they're putting their faith in. And if this can't be scientifically or technologically proven, uh, is it really worth my time? And then the idea, too, of uh, we, we uh, are, are moving away from the idea of coming together as a group, as community. You know, there was um, a book that came out a number of years ago, a very good book. It was, I think it was called something like Bowling Alone. Hmm. And the whole premise of it was that we stopped being, at some point, a society of joiners. Mm -hmm. So people didn't bowl in leagues anymore. They didn't feel the need to come together. It was also that at the same time, people were not joining the Rotary Club or the Lions Club or, uh, you know, women's groups, things like that, because people started to just kind of go off on their own. And then, of course, technology allows people to be in contact with millions of people if they want and never leave their kitchen table. So, so that phenomenon also argues uh, against coming together as a community of faith too, because people aren't joiners anymore. Right. And, and so all of this put together gave me a great concern, but most importantly, the fact that we need people to be really present before the real presence of Christ. And so we need to, we have work to do. We have a catechesis to do, you know, we need to re reinvigorate. And in some case, discover for the first time for people, 
what the church teaches about the richness of the Holy Eucharist. You know, it doesn't have to be a big theological treatise, right. uh, but there, there, there has to be obviously the faith element. Uh, because right. without the eyes of faith, all you're going to see is, is a host, a, yeah. a, a bread, you know, bread and wine. Mm -hmm. The eyes of faith allow you to see, and it's a gift. Faith is a gift. The sacraments are a gift. Only through that faith do you see not the elements of bread and wine, mm -hmm. but the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. So the things that we're going to be doing this year um, primarily are the things that the church has already given us, but maybe have fallen out of some uh, out of use. Right. You know, so my, my biggest uh hope for this year is that through the year and as a legacy of this year, not my legacy, but the people's legacy is that our parishes would have at least weekly times of adoration before the blessed sacrament combined with confession, because we can't talk about the Holy Eucharist without the sacrament of penance. They go together. One prepares for the other. Mm -hmm. Penance prepares us to receive the Holy Eucharist. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, that would, to me, be a great victory if we had more Eucharistic adoration, more time for confession, and prayers for vocations to the priesthood and the religious life that take place in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament. That's where vocations come from people on their knees praying and families willing to support a man or woman's desire to serve the church. And uh, so often one or both of those things are missing mm -hmm. when a young person is trying to determine whether God is calling them or not. So, uh, you know, it's it, what, what I, what I'm, what I'm presenting to our people to do uh, is not creative in any way. It's, 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 it's what the church already has for us. We just have sure. to use it. It's so powerful. Yeah. You know, but we, we've let it on the shelf for too long. Yeah. Well, it's beautiful when, um, I mean, it's such a beautiful theme that so clearly ties into where we're at and where we need to be as a church that I'm sure that you must re have received some great feedback from the clergy and from parishioners about this year of real presence, because it, it couldn't have come at a better time. And I would imagine that there are other dioceses who would hear this and think, you know, of course, <laughs> that's what we should be focused on right now. Well, it, it's true. Uh, I, I've gotten a lot of uh, correspondence of gratitude. No one has written me, thankfully, to say, you shouldn't be doing this. That's a good thing. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> That's a good thing, right? That is a good thing. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, since then, the, the National Bishops Conference, United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, has also now um, started planning on how on a national level hmm. we can reinvigorate uh, our, our belief and our devotion to the Holy Eucharist. So, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm glad we're doing it. To me, that seems like a little affirmation that we're on yeah. the right track. Sure. But um, how can you not be on the right track when you're promoting, you know, devotion uh, and worship of the Holy Eucharist? I, you know, I, I, I think it's, like I said, it's not creative and it's something you really can't make a mistake in doing. I'll say, absolutely. Well, Bishop, um, I don't want to take too much more of your time. I really, I really appreciate you being on the on the podcast today. I know how busy a bishop's calendar is, and uh, as always, I appreciate you. I appreciate your friendship, and I appreciate the the time that you spent with us today. This has been wonderful, especially because it's been a while since you and I chatted. So I feel like we got to catch up a little bit here. This has been wonderful. It was a nice uh, opportunity to catch up, and um, you know, ha Hopefully, some others will have will be eavesdropping into our conversation here. Yes, uh, Jim. So I, I wish a great success with your your podcast and the the ministry that you you have around that for your future formation and discernment towards the permanent diaconate too. 
Thank you, Bishop. And thanks for the opportunity to discern that. You're welcome. God bless. God bless you and all of your listeners. Thank you. Thanks. I want to thank Bishop Schlert for being on our show today and for sharing his love for the diocese and all of his wonderful insights with us. Bishop, it was a real privilege having you on Advancing Our Church. Thank you. And if you'd like more information about Bishop Schlert and the Year of the Real Presence or the Diocese of Allentown, I'll leave links in our show notes. And once again, if you'd like to view the full video presentation of the podcast, I encourage you to visit the show's episode page on advancingourchurch.com. Well, that's our show this week. Many thanks to the Changing Our World podcast team and to Pottery Studios for another great show. And if you'd like more information about our show, please visit us at advancingourchurch.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Advancing Our Church is a production of Changing Our World, and we are a fundraising and social impact consulting firm that has been advising both nonprofits and corporations for over 21 years. For more information, please visit us at changingourworld.com. Well, that's it for me, everyone. Again, happy Memorial Day. Have a great week. Take care. We'll see you next week where we'll talk about diocesan annual appeals. And I have an extremely talented special panel of annual appeal experts who will join me for that conversation. Have a great week, everyone. God bless.